Right, that's it. I think that's the transition. Hi, welcome everyone to the next session. Uh, my name's Chris Bailey. I'll be introducing the next host. So we have with us here uh, Ziad Obermeyer, um, an associate professor and the Blue Cross of California Distinguished Professor of Health Policy and Management at the Barclay School of Public Health. Um, Ziad trained as an emergency doctor and he still gets away as often as he can to a hospital in rural Arizona to do what he loves, work in the ER. But these days, Ziad spends most of his time doing research and teaching at UC Berkeley. Inspired by his clinical work, he builds machine learning algorithms that help doctors make better decisions. He also studies where algorithms can go wrong, how they can scale up racial bias, and how to fix them. He's received numerous awards from the National Academy of Medicine, the NIH, and publishes in a wide range of journals. His work has been high, highly influential and is frequently cited in the public debate about algorithms, as well as federal and state regulatory guidance and civil investigations. So without any further ado, I shall pass you over to see how thank you so much chris um and as i struggle to share my screen um i'll say that as as chris mentioned a lot of the work that i do is is actually very uh optimistic about the role that algorithms can play um in medicine and and i think that that's um that's founded in my belief that there are lots of very productive things that algorithms um, can and should do around risk prediction, around diagnostics. Um, but at the same time, there are many ways that that optimistic vision um, can falter. And I think that's really important for us to keep in mind because um, that's the, the single um, greatest threat to, I think, all of the gains that we can make using algorithms um, in medicine is, is letting them go wrong in these um, increasingly well-known ways. And so what I want to do today um, is, is just walk through two case studies um, of, of where algorithms can go wrong and more optimistically, where they can go right. So the first algorithm is going to be the, um, uh, the evil twin, and, and the second one um, is going to be the, the good twin, the one that hopefully gives you a, um, a more positive vision of what I think algorithms can do. Um, so um, along the way, I'm going to try to highlight two common themes that, that, I try to, um, that I try to stay mindful of in a lot of my work. One is that so much of the ways that algorithms can go wrong come from um, the wrong target variable. Training algorithms to predict the wrong thing, often a convenient and tempting proxy. Um, and the second one is that um, a lot of the problems in algorithms come from underlying um, issues that I'm trying very hard to fix, and I'll, I'll tell you about that um, soon. So uh, let me start with the first case study. Um, the, the setting here is one that I think will be familiar to um, all of you and, and basically everyone who's working in health, which is that there's a small number of patients with very complex needs um, whose care gets fragmented and poor, who have high costs and who have bad outcomes. Um, and so the way that almost all health systems in the country and, and in a lot of the world have started to get, their, uh, get a handle on this um, is through high-risk care management. So the way I think about high-risk care management um, is basically like a VIP program for patients who really need help. Um, extra primary care slots, home visits, um, you know, uh, whatever you need, medication refills, they will get it. But of course, all of that stuff is itself expensive. And so you, you can't do it for everyone. And so you need to target it um, to the people in your primary care population or your insured population who need it the most. Um, and that's where algorithms come in, of course, because this sounds like a really good use of algorithms. So we study this one piece of software made by one company. It's one of the biggest in this market. And um, by that company's estimates, the software is being used to help make medical decisions for about 70 million patients per year. If you look at the market estimates for this family of algorithms that all work in essentially the same way, it's the majority of the US population that's being screened through one of these algorithms every year. So it's one thing to keep in mind is that the scale of these algorithms already in the healthcare system is just enormous. Um, how these algorithms work is fundamentally trying to find patients who are going to get sick. So we are taking care of this population today. 
um, there are some needles in that haystack that we really want to know about now because those people are going to get sick. And if we knew who they were today, we could target them with this high risk care management set of interventions. Um, and we could do two things. One is we could make them healthier and prevent all of these, um, these uh, complications down the road. So better health for the patient. And of course, we keep them out of the ER and the hospital we prevent them from seeing, uh, you know, sub substandard quality doctors like me, um, and we drive down healthcare costs at the same time. And so everyone wins in this scenario. Um, the way these algorithms work concretely is they they say, okay, you've got this population of patients. I'm going to look um, in my algorithmic crystal ball um, ahead a year, and I'm going to predict of all of these patients that look okay now, who is going to cost us a lot of money in the next year um, as a proxy for who's going to get sick. And that's going to let you target help now. So you're going to take the highest risk people and you're going to fast track them into this population health management program. So we were working with one health system. Um, and, and as we've worked with uh, many others over the, um, the next few years after this project, they all work in essentially the same way, although the details vary a little bit. But essentially, imagine the algorithm generates some distribution of risk. Um, the top few percent in the in the hospital we studied got fast tracked into the high risk care management program. Um, about the next half down got shown to their primary care doctors. So the primary care doctor got a list with all the patients, the algorithm score, um, and some information. And the PCP got to decide if this patient should be enrolled in the high risk care management program. And everyone else just got screened out. Um, so. In a, in a very concrete way, where you are in this distribution, the algorithm score determines how you're gonna get treated and your level of access to the program. So we were interested in, in studying whether this algorithm was biased. And, um, and one, you know, I think really important thing about studying bias is that in order to study it, you need to define it in a very crisp way. And that definition needs to be rooted in how the algorithm is being used in this real world setting. So as I just told you, um, people who have the same algorithmic score are treated the same way. And since we're trying to allocate this program that helps them with their health needs, those people who have the same score should have the same needs. So that's our very crisp statement of what an unbiased algorithm would do. Um, and in particular, you know, if those people have the same needs, the, the, the color of their skin shouldn't matter um, for their score or how they're treated. Um, that is not what we found. So let me show you this graph and I'll just walk through the axes um, in detail because I'll show you another one just like it. So on the x-axis, on the horizontal axis, we're ranking everyone by their algorithm risk score um, in percentiles. So very low at zero and very high at 100. And you can see that um, the dotted black vertical line to the right of that line is where the fast track um, into the program starts. So everyone above that gets fast tracked in. On the y-axis, I'm showing you one measure of their health needs over that next year. Um, so this is, you can think about this as basically like a comorbidity score. So if they had an encounter for heart failure, for diabetes, for kidney failure, whatever, over that year, you get a plus one on the score. You just tally up all of these exacerbations of chronic conditions over that year as a measure of health. We looked at a lot of other measures and they all look the same way, but let me just show you this one. The two lines here show the averages for black patients on, on top in purple and white patients um, on the bottom in gold. And what you can see is that no matter where we are in that algorithm risk distribution, the purple line is above the gold line. And what that means is that the black patients are doing worse in terms of their realized health at any given algorithm score. Um, so that uh, is a disturbing finding. It's not immediately obvious from this graph how big this bias is. So let me just give you one fact about that. And I'll start by giving you like a, a fact that's a general fact about how we think about bias. If you look at that high priority population um, in shaded in purple today, uh, when we studied this program, that fast track was 18% black. And you might've looked at that number and compared it to the base rate of black patients in this primary care population, which is 12%. And you might've thought, wow, actually the algorithm is overrepresenting black patients in the high priority group by 50%. This looks great. Um, this algorithm doesn't look biased at all because it's, it's overrepresenting black patients. If you, instead of looking at the population rate, judged needs and said, okay, we're gonna actually give priority uh, in this in this fast track to people with bad health, um, not 
the algorithm score, you would have ended up with a fast track that was almost half black. So even though if you compared the population rates, this algorithm looks good, um, it's dramatically underrepresenting black patients relative to their health needs. Um, and I think that's just a, a thing to keep in mind um, when, we're, when we're thinking about whether an algorithm is biased, these kinds of simple measures are often very misleading. So we, of course, wanted to understand what was going wrong in this algorithm. And a really important clue to that was where this algorithm was going right. So here's a graph that again shows patients ranked by their risk on the x-axis. But now on the y-axis, instead of showing you a measure of health, I'm showing you how much those patients cost. And what you can see here is that those lines are basically sitting right on top of each other. Um, so for black patients and white patients alike, costs are increasing a lot in predicted risk. It's a, it's a log scale on the y-axis. All these graphs were done in R, by the way. Um, I, I, hope, I hope you guys noticed. Um, uh, so these, these lines are sitting right on top of each other um, and, they're, and they're predicting costs very well. So this algorithm is actually doing a great job and a fairly unbiased job of predicting total healthcare costs for both black and white patients alike. So putting this together, the algorithm is biased for predicting health, but unbiased for predicting cost. Why is that? Well, it's because black and white patients don't have the same correlation structure between their health and their costs. And that's for two main reasons. First is that white patients have better access to the healthcare system. Now this is an insured population, so this isn't even about insurance, but even within an insured population, transportation, poverty, job schedule, family support, all of these other things mean that conditional on someone's needing healthcare, white patients face lower barriers to actually accessing that healthcare and generating costs. The other problem, of course, is that our health system just treats black patients differently. So there are many, many studies that show that um, doctors are less likely to recommend invasive um, testing for heart disease, um, less likely to treat pain, all of these other things that again, lead to fewer costs being totaled up um, at, at the end of that year. So to summarize, conditional on someone's health, black patients are going to cost lower, not because they don't need healthcare, but because they don't get healthcare. Um, and so when you train an algorithm to predict cost accurately, you are at the same time training it to predict health in a biased way. And I think that's the, the summary of the, of the whole paper. So let me try to distill that into, into lessons. It's really, really important when we're building algorithms, when we're critically evaluating algorithms for use or for purchase, um, that we articulate exactly what the algorithm should be doing. What is the ideal target, the ideal piece of information that this algorithm should be providing to help me as the decision maker um, do my job and make the best decisions um, possible? And that's how we hold algorithms accountable. We articulate in very precise terms what the algorithm is supposed to be predicting. In this case, it was health needs. And then we compare that to what it is actually predicting, which is healthcare costs. And if those two are different, as they often are in, in subtle seeming, but really, really important ways, um, you get what we call label choice bias. So the bias that results from choosing the wrong label, um, predicting the wrong variable, often a convenient proxy um, for, for the underlying thing that we actually care about. Now, on a more optimistic note, I wanna point out that um, when you detect and articulate bias in this way, at the same time, you're potentially giving yourself a roadmap for fixing the bias because we've articulated that the algorithm is doing this thing wrong and actually here's how to do it better. Um, and so in this case, what we did is we, we actually um, just cold emailed the company that made this algorithm and we told them that we had identified this problem and they were very motivated to work with us to fix it. And so with their, um, uh, technical teams, we actually rebuilt the algorithm. We trained it to predict a basket of health outcomes, not just cost. And in so doing, we dramatically reduced um, the amount of bias in that in that resulting algorithm. So that was uh, two years ago, and, and we, we were very lucky to get um, some attention for that article. And what we tried to do is turn that attention into um, collaborations with a bunch of health systems, insurers, tech companies, and, and regulators at the state and federal level. Um, and that reinforced a lot of the, um, the lessons that we, that we actually took from that original paper. So the bad news first is that we basically, any time that an organization approached us for collaboration around a particular algorithm, 
or for a more global assessment of bias in all of the algorithms that we're using, we found it. So we've replicated this initial finding from one algorithm in several other algorithms that do population health resource allocation, all around that issue of predicting costs when they should have been predicting something um, more linked to a patient's health. We found it in a lot of clinical prediction tools because those clinical tools often predict, you know, that what do they say they're doing? They say they're predicting diabetes, what are they actually predicting? They're predicting an ICD code for diabetes or a test done by a doctor for diabetes. And in so doing, they're leaving out a bunch of people who never get diagnosed, who are in many ways the people we care about the most in these clinical prediction tasks. Um, it's not limited to um, clinical uh, or population health tools. It's also these, these very detailed operational decisions. So for example, think about what a lot of your primary care clinics do in, in your health systems. They predict who's not gonna show up for an appointment. There are two types of people who don't show up for an appointment. There's the people who choose not to show up for the appointment. And then there's the people who can't show up for the appointment because of barriers to access, transportation, even sometimes getting too sick to actually go to the clinic. So now think about the fact that we're predicting who's not gonna show up and we're reallocating those clinic slots to someone else who is going to show up, you're basically doing the same thing. For that person who wants to show up but couldn't, you're taking that slot away from someone who faces barriers to access, and you're giving it to someone who doesn't face barriers to access. So it's exactly the wrong thing, um, which is a recurring theme in a lot of these um, things that we found. Now, again, the good news is that in all of these cases, in the same data frames that the original algorithms were trained on, there is a less biased label that we can use to retrain that algorithm and make it um, far less biased and, and turn it from a tool that reinforces all of these awful disparities in our society and in our healthcare system into algorithms that actually reallocate resources to people who need them. And all of that is by retraining the algorithm on a label that's less biased. Um, and so I'll, I'll post this in the in the chat if I can later, but uh, you can also just Google um, algorithmic bias playbook. Um, we tried to distill all of these lessons from our work and our collaborations with dozens of um, partners uh, over the past couple of years into this playbook um, and, and, and make it very practical and, and useful and hopefully readable. There are a couple of um, jokes in there too, uh, if you manage to make it through all the way. Um, so let me just distill all of this down into a couple of things. Getting the exact target for the algorithm really matters. And I think that, you know, um, it's very tempting when we, we've done all of the work to get all the data that we need into our data frame and you're, and you're looking at it um, and, and you just wanna get to work. You just wanna like, yeah, I, I got all this data. Now I just wanna build it and predict this thing. And, and that decision is often made pretty expediently when it should be made very, very carefully. Because that data frame is a portrait of the world as it is, not the world as it should be. Um, we have a, a short article, I'll also post this in the, in the chat, um, that's called On the Inequity of Predicting A While Hoping for B. And this is a, a play on an old classic article in management, um, which is on the folly of rewarding A while hoping for B. Um, all of us are very familiar with this in health because what, what do we, um, what do we reward in health in a fee-for-service model? We reward more care. What do we hope to get? Uh, good care. Those two things are different. And algorithms work very, very similarly. We often train an algorithm to predict A, but hope it's actually going to predict B. We train it hoping it's going to predict someone who has high health care needs, but actually we're just training it to predict cost. Um, many of these um, variables that you want, someone's true healthcare needs are missing from your data set. Um, and when they're there, they're measured with a lot of bias. And so we just need to be really, really careful um, and, and, and deliberate when we're picking targets for those algorithms. The second one that I wanted to mention is that um, I mentioned one of these, which is that very simple heuristics about bias can be very misleading. I already showed you one about population representation. So the baseline population was 12% black. The fast track was 18% black. We might have concluded based on that, that this algorithm was unbiased and we would have been very wrong. Similarly, I think there's a tendency to equate um, bias with the presence or absence of race-based adjustments. Now, I can tell you that in this case, this algorithm that we studied explicitly did not contain a race-based adjustments because the people who made it were very worried about bias when they built the algorithm. Um, as you saw, 
the absence of race-based adjustments does not guarantee unbiasedness, just like the presence of racial um, adjustments doesn't guarantee that something is biased. It all really depends on what that label is and what the use case is for the algorithm. And finally, this kind of bias from label choice can be very hard to catch. As I showed you, had you just taken the algorithm at face value and looked at its ability to predict cost, you would have found that the algorithm is basically unbiased for predicting cost. But that would have been catastrophically wrong because the algorithm wasn't supposed to just predict cost. It wasn't a finance tool to be used in the hospital's accounting department. It was a tool to be used to allocate a health resource. And that's what allowed us to catch this bias. It was understanding what population health is supposed to do, understanding how these algorithms are used. And I wanted to flag that because the people in this uh, virtual room, you guys have exactly the kind of knowledge to catch these problems. You guys are you know, typically working within health systems or just have deep knowledge of health, but you also know um, how algorithms work and how data frames work. Um, and so that combination of things is exactly the kind of thing that you need to catch these problems. And I really hope that you start um, taking a careful look at the algorithms that you encounter in your work um, and, and, and elsewhere um, to try to find these kinds of problems because the scale is huge and the potential for harm is, is also huge. Okay, um, let me move on to um, to the good twin from the evil twin. Um, so I'll start with a, an observation that is sad, but um, fairly obvious, which is that when you look at the distribution of pain, so look at surveys that ask people like, over the past couple of days, have you been in severe pain? It is shocking how unequally distributed pain is like everything else in the world. And so um, poor patients, um, non-white patients in the US and around the world just report a lot more pain. Um, and I just wanna pause there and kind of acknowledge that fact because it's a, you know, we talk a lot about income inequality, but there's inequality in these daily experiences in people's lives that is truly awful and, and, and can, you know, reinforce all of the problems that we see around income inequality as well. Um, and so, you know, in these surveys in the US, black patients have twice the um, prevalence of being in severe pain at any given point in time. That's a lot. So you might think, well, you know, like everything else, um, you know, uh, pain and, and, and medical things are just more common. And so you might just think this increased pain is the result of, for example, more um, arthritis or other things that cause pain. But it's actually not that simple. So there are lots of papers that do a variant on the following exercise, which is, um, let's say, um, take people with, uh, with knee arthritis and then take two patients. Um, and rather than just comparing who's in more pain, who's in less pain, let's actually condition on the way their knee looks. So let's, let's take people whose knees look the same on the x-ray um, and let's compare their pain scores. And a very surprising finding is that black patients, lower income, lower education patients, they still report more pain even when their x-rays look the same to the radiologist. And so that's a, a mystery um, that, that's been in the medical literature for, for a long time. And the way largely the literature has, has squared this circle is to make the following observation. So, you know, we've looked at the knees um, and, and we've, we've determined that the knees are looking the same. So if it's not in their knees, the source of the pain Maybe it's in their heads. And I don't mean this in a, in a bad way at all. There's a lot of really excellent research um, that looks at the fact that um, take two patients, one is under more stress than the other, the more stressed patient is going to report more pain from the same physical stimulus. Um, there's a lot of psychosomatic factors. There's just a lot of other things going on in the lives of um, poorer people, non-white people that make them less able to, um, to cope with pain. So for all these reasons, it's very plausible that this is, that this is the case. Um, alternatively, the, the problem could be with doctors. Doctors are under-treating um, some patients um, relative to the, to the amount of pain medication, for example, that they should be getting. So let me just walk through the, the concrete scenario just to give you a real sense of how this might play out in practice. So a patient walks into your office with knee pain and you refer her um, for an x-ray after, of course, doing a very careful physical exam because that's very important. Um, and if the implication of this literature is taken seriously, what you'll find on average from that x-ray is that the pain that your black patient is reporting is not going to be reflected or is less likely to be reflected in the disease severity on that x-ray report. 
So what's going to happen is you're going to say, well, the knee looks okay. So I'm going to pursue some other things. I'm going to, um, you know, work on stress or work on other things, but I'm not going to refer them to an orthopedist or, um, or, or do anything else that's specifically focused on the knee. Now notice that everything I've told you so far depends a lot on what we mean by disease severity. Like the knees look the same, the disease severity is the same. All these statements are very, very dependent on measurement. And so how do we measure this in the case of, of knee arthritis? Um, well, let me show you the, um, the current state of the art. It's someone looking at the knee uh, and, and doing a very careful job of grading it according to accepted criteria. So what are these accepted criteria? Um, well, there are objective grading scales that you know go through every compartment of the knee um, and, and grade them. And, and the most commonly used scale was developed by doctors uh, Kelgren and Lawrence in 1957. That's the, the Kelgren-Lawrence grade. And when you go back to those original studies, you find that they were done by comparing, for example, coal miners um, to office workers in England in the 1950s. And there's, in fact, in these original studies, uh, in the in the methods or you know whatever that section was back then, they don't even mention race or sex composition of this population because it was all the same. And so that might um, that might make you worried, and that might make you think like, well, you know, if that's the the state of the medical knowledge and, and where these radiologist um, impressions and scores are coming from, maybe we could do better with an algorithm. And so, you know, if humans are missing something, we know that algorithms are now achieving um, very high performance on these kinds of tasks. And so we might want to enlist an algorithm to help. Um, but here's the problem. When you look at all of these papers that are training ConvNets to look at x-rays, what do they do? They say, oh, we've achieved human level performance. But that's exactly what we don't want. We do not want human level performance. We want um, an algorithm that actually does better than these humans who might be making mistakes um, predictably or might be biased in other ways. Um, and so that is, I think, a deep problem in a lot of this literature is that we say we're predicting atrial fibrillation. We say we're predicting arthritis, but in fact, what we're predicting is a doctor looking at a thing and telling us what the doctor sees. And those two things can be subtly but importantly different in the same way that someone's health needs and their health costs can be different too. Because one is an objective statement um, about someone's health and their physiology, and the other is filtered through um, layers and layers of bias and structural disadvantage um, that we might not want. So again, um, to return to a common theme, we were interested in seeing whether we could find a better target for prediction. And so the, the, the standard ML playbook here, as I mentioned, is to get a bunch of x-rays um, and train the, uh, the, the, the network to spit out what the radiologist would have said about this knee. Now, it turns out that there's another human um, that you might want to ask about the knee, and that's the patient. Um, and that was the, the basic idea for our, um, for our revised effort to train an algorithm to interpret x-rays, is not learning from what the radiologist sees when she looks at x-rays, but listening to the patient when she says, my pain is nine out of 10 from this knee that might not have looked so bad to the radiologist. Now, this, uh, this will not be news to any of um, you, but uh, finding data to do this is not at all straightforward. So it is pretty easy to find um, x-rays paired with a radiologist's interpretation of that x-ray because that's sitting on every hospital's PAC system. So it's easy to just like pull that out and, and dump it. But um, as any of you who have tried to um, get patient reported outcomes into your hospital's um, uh, data warehouse knows, that is still pretty rare and pretty hard to do, and it's very labor intensive to do. And so it's a lot harder to find um, data sets that match those two things, the x-ray with the patient's experience of pain. So we were very, very lucky um, because there's an NIH study of knee arthritis um, that we were able to uh, plug into and just get the data. Um, and once we had that data, which is something I'll come back to in a second, it's a very, very straightforward ML problem because then instead of just running the old playbook of getting the x-rays and training a network to predict the radiologist, you get the x-rays and train the network to predict the patient's um, knee pain. And I wanna make a point that, um, that, that I think is one of the coolest tricks of ML in this, in this area, which is that if an algorithm can tell, you know, given two knees, oh, this one's painful, this one's not painful. That means that there is signal for predicting pain in the knee. So 
we try to rule out some confounding factors, which is always a problem. But if you can predict pain from the pixels of the x-ray, then you can trace that pain to something in the knee that is showing up on the x-ray and not something that is in society or in someone's head. So let me just show you a couple of summary statistics from that. So this is in our sample is like a, a longitudinal sample um, of people with knee pain across the US. It's a very diverse population. Um, and if you just compare black and white patients, their, their average level of pain, it's enormous. So this is a kind of counterintuitive scale where <clears throat> No pain is 100, and severe pain is less than 86. And the unconditional difference between black and white is about 11 points. So it's over halfway between no, no pain and severe pain every day. So that's like the baseline. And if you control for KLG, this is the radiologist score, you actually account for about 9% of that gap. So, so black patients on average have, have worse knee arthritis, and that's, um, getting, that's accounting for 9% of this gap. But if you adjust for our algorithm's severity measure, our algorithm predicted pain score, you actually get rid of about half of that gap or five times more than the standard measure. Um, and we see similar results for income and education. So the algorithm is finding things in that x-ray that are linked to pain. And it's things that are disproportionately affecting black patients in our sample and are disproportionately not making their way into the radiologist's severity judgment as manifested in, this, in the KLG score. So um, there are a few things this could be. The most important one is, as, as a recent paper um, suggests, algorithms can actually reconstruct race um, from an x-ray, but they could also reconstruct body mass index or anything else that's correlated to pain. And one advantage of this data set is that we can actually control for those things directly. So rather than saying, oh, the algorithm could be reconstructing some imperfect measure of race, we can actually just put race into the algorithms uh, or, or into the regression directly. And we show that actually just including a perfect version of race, or at least a self-reported version of race, doesn't change the algorithm's ability to predict pain. So it's still predicting pain even when you tell the algorithm this person is black or white. It's predicting it with the same um, strength, and that correlation is, is about the same size. So we don't think any of these observed things are actually why the algorithm is, um, is, is able to uh, read pain off of these x-rays. Um, we cross-validate across study sites. It's not picking up on artifacts that might be from some sites having more pain than others. Um, it's not even better weighting of the radiologist features. So um, if you just regress the algorithm pain score on all of the detailed radiologist reports on every single compartment, you can't explain the algorithm score with things that we know about already. So the algorithm does seem to be finding new sources of signal in that x-ray and a really important and open question um, is what those things are that we're trying to address um, with some of our um, collaborators, including um, Judy Jachoya at um, Emory. So why is this so important and, and not just a curiosity about um, pain scores? It's because the way we judge severity is the way we allocate a lot of things, including most critically um, knee replacement surgeries. Um, and we know that there are huge disparities between um, black and white populations in, um, in rates of uh, access to this. And, and you know, I think the, the going hypothesis, of course, like, like so many other things, this is kind of income, insurance, access, things like that. But what if it's also the way we're reading x-rays that's systematically excluding people um, from getting access to these therapies. So we did the following simulation exercise. Let's take all of the patients with severe pain um, uh, in our sample. And, and these are patients that, you know, that's part of the criteria for um, not just referral to an orthopedic surgeon, but in many settings, um, insurance companies actually use these criteria um, to allocate uh, and, and, and to, to determine who's eligible for surgery. So pain is half the problem. But of course, you can't just replace people's knees because they're in pain, they have to have a knee problem. You don't want to be replacing someone's knee for a problem that's not in their knee. So what we did is among those people with severe pain, we simulated swapping out the radiologist severity score for our algorithm severity score and giving the same number of knee replacements um, to people who were in pain and that looked bad to the algorithm, not people who were in pain and looked bad to the radiologist. And if we did that, we would actually double the fraction of black knees that were eligible for surgery. So this, again, is a pretty large amount of bias um, in these simulated guidelines resulting from using the radiologist's opinion rather than something else. So 
stepping back, I, I think this is going to be a really big research area, not, not the knee pain stuff specifically, but finding better proxy measures um, rather than human judgment. The whole reason we want algorithms in medicine is not to reproduce what humans are doing, including all of our errors and biases. We want algorithms to do better than humans. Um, but if we want to do that, then we need algorithms that are learning from nature, not learning just from humans. Um, the problem is that data on these patient outcomes and, and experiences that we need to train the algorithms are siloed. They're locked up in health systems. Um, and so this market is fundamentally broken. Um, if you're lucky enough to be at a hospital who has x-rays linked to patient reported outcomes, that's great. But think about how talent is distributed. Like what, what's the likelihood that the right person is gonna be in the right place with the right data? Um, it, it's just very small. And I think it's been a huge barrier um, to this field becoming like a real um, field. And so I wanted to mention um, one uh, nonprofit uh, venture that, that I co-founded a couple of years ago um, called Nightingale Open Science. And you know, to summarize the the point of this exercise is basically just ImageNet for medicine. Um, it is a, um, a way for us to build relationships with health systems in the US and around the world, uh, academic centers, but also under-resourced county health systems and invest in building up exactly these kinds of data sets. Data sets of uh, medical imaging linked to interesting patient outcomes and, and experiences and curated around really critical um, unsolved medical problems like sudden cardiac death, like cancer metastasis, like pain. So in all these areas, I think um, algorithms applied to images and waveforms have huge potential, um, but it's just hard to get access to the data. So we create the data inside the health system. Um, we actually have a lot of philanthropic money available if anyone's interested in building some data sets um, around knee pain, other kinds of pain, um, patient reported outcomes, that would be great. Please, please get in touch with me. We've got We've got a ton of money um, and we just give it to people to build data sets. Those data sets stay in the health system and the health system does whatever it wants. Uh, researchers can run their own projects. We can pay for anything, researcher time, et cetera. And then in exchange, we get a de-identified um, HIPAA safe harbor version of that. And we put that on our cloud server and we make that available to nonprofit researchers at, at no cost under a very lightweight DUA that looks basically like the Mimic DUA. Um, and so um, please get in touch with me if you are um, in the business of making data sets for your research. Um, we, we can absolutely work together. Um, or if you're interested in uh, getting access to this, uh, we're starting to give access to it to kind of uh, friends and family, which I consider all of you. Um, and we're launching publicly at a NeurIPS workshop uh, this December. I think it's December um, 14th. And I'll, I'll post links uh, in the chat as well. So um, let me close by saying that all of these examples have taught me that finding that right target for the algorithm, the label choice problem is really central. It is a huge source of problem in health algorithms. And, and as I'm learning, as I do more of this work outside of health, it's very similar in other fields. So in many, many settings, we're interested in predicting some underlying quantity, but we don't see that underlying quantity, we just see some convenient proxy. So in criminal justice, we might be interested in predicting someone's true likelihood of committing another crime, but we don't have that in our data set. We have a variable called arrests or convictions. Um, in finance, we're interested in creditworthiness. Is someone gonna pay back their loan? But instead what we have is income. So in all of these settings, I think we face similar problems. And, and because we can actually get data um, and, and all of you can get data to explore some of these questions in health, I think a lot of other fields are actually learning a lot about what bias looks like because it's much harder to access data on algorithms and predictions and outcomes in other fields. Um, whereas in health, all these algorithms are just sitting in the health systems um, data warehouse where people like you can access it and study it and, and detect bias and other problems. So I think this is a major opportunity for all of you and all of us who are working at the intersection of um, health and data science. And I think that people like you who are bilingual, who are kind of interested in, in, um, in health and understand what are important and interesting questions to ask, but also have the capacity to, to, to do stuff with data. Um, all of you, I think, are the future of this, uh, of this field. Um, and, and I'd love to work with you. So i um, looking forward to, um, hopefully we have time for some questions. Um, uh, and I will stop here.
Hello. Sorry, I can't get my camera back on. Hang on a minute. Oh, I'm pressing the button. I can I can hear you, Chris. So. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, you don't need to see my face. Anyway, the ghost I don't know. The doesn't seem to work. So, not uh, to worry. Anyway, thank you very much. That was absolutely fascinating. The chat has been very enthusiastic throughout as well. Um, I love the idea of. Um, well, I, we in my team we're very interested in things like fairness and algorithmic fairness, but the idea of being doing better than a, than a human, I think, is a really sort of novel, uh, brilliant one. Um, so let's go to some of the questions in the chat. Um, so let's start with this one. How do you deal with a flurry of fairness metrics in the literature? Isn't every model unfair under at least one definition? Thanks for uh, pointing that out. It's, it's such a great question. And I think there's, um, you know, there, there's a proliferation of fairness measures in, in the literature. And, and exactly as you suggest, um, there's also some very elegant proofs that unless very specific and unlikely conditions are met, you cannot simultaneously satisfy um, all of these things. So I, I just posted in a link to that um, algorithmic uh, bias playbook that I that I mentioned. And, and so here's kind of how I think about it. Um, because precisely because there are so many measures and you can't have it all, you need to work backwards from the real world use case of these algorithms. So what is the algorithm doing exactly? What is the decision the algorithm is trying to inform? And what is the ideal piece of information that you'd like to give that decision maker to help them make the decision better? And so working backwards from that is, you know, I think we didn't articulate, we, we didn't know enough to articulate it in this way in our original study, but um, that's how we define bias. So we, we say, okay, for example, this, algorithm is being used to allocate a resource that helps people with health. Um, and what we want it to do is we want that to go to people with high health needs. So that is the articulation of you know, the ideal target. So now all we need to do is find some measure of health needs. And then we take the algorithm score. We look at um, people in our, in our two categories, whatever categories you, or, or five categories or whatever um, categories you want to um, investigate bias on. And you compare that um, ultimate ideal target that you're interested in for people at the same score. Um, and I think that has a nice set of parallels to a lot of um, uh, civil rights law, for example, um, that, that does the same kind of thing. It, um, in fact, there's, there's one case, I'll just kind of, this is a, a bit of a tangent, but it's kind of interesting. So there was a case in the 70s that went to the Supreme Court and it was a, a jail that wanted to uh, hire, um, hire people to kind of like lift heavy stuff and, and do kind of maintenance at the jail. Um, and what they did is they set height and weight requirements. So you needed to be above a certain height or above a certain weight um, to be considered for this job. And what the Supreme Court ruled uh, as it went all the way up in, in the process was that that was actually unconstitutional because that discriminated against um, women. Now, that, that was ruled to be discriminatory because it was a proxy for the ultimate quantity of interest, which was someone's ability to actually do the job and move heavy objects. And so what the Supreme Court said is you can actually evaluate people on their ability to move around heavy stuff. Um, and that actually might lead to fewer women being hired if women are less able to move around heavy stuff than men. But that is the ideal target for your hiring. And you're not allowed to use discriminatory proxies. Um, so that's, I think that that's referenced in the playbook. I, I forget the, the actual name of the case. Um, but I, I think there's a really nice parallel between that and, and what we're trying to do, which is articulate the ideal target and hold the algorithm accountable for that. And that's your way out of this morass of, of lots of different fairness measures um, that, um, that, that, that I think are, are genuinely very confusing to figure out which to use. So working backwards from the decision, the ideal target and evaluating the algorithm based on that. Great. Thank you. Okay. So the next question is, um, are there published guidelines that could be used to analyze your algorithm for bias and mitigate them? Yeah. So, um, so I think, I mean, there, there's a, there's a ton of work in this, um, in this space. And I think that there's also, uh, I'll also mention, cause I think I saw this in the chat. There's also, I think, um, a lot of, um, packages that, that are kind of like trying to build solutions that are screening algorithms for, for bias. And so I put these all in the same category of like, can we create some generic tools um, for assessing bias? And I think you can to some extent. So um, when the bias is resulting from like a failure of generalization, so it's trained on one population 
it's uh, discriminatory on another population. So this is something that's like the uh, the pulse oximetry example, where um, you know apparently the, the 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 pulse oximeter was trained on a pretty homogeneous population, and it um, misestimates um, true uh, oxy blood oxygen uh, concentration for patients with darker skin. So that's a very straightforward failure of generalization. It was supposed to be predicting oxygen. It fails to predict oxygen. But contrast that to some of the cases that we were studying, where the algorithm was supposed to be predicting cost. If you just looked at cost and ran a package, you would have concluded that the algorithm was unbiased. So what do you need to do to find that bias? Well, you need to engage in this kind of semantic exercise of what is the value system that this algorithm is um, is is trying to learn. What is the purpose of the algorithm? And the purpose is never in your data set. The purpose is just something that you as a human, <laughs> uh, all of us as humans need to figure out. And that's not in the data. And that's why I think like generic guidelines can have some time, but they, they have their, their utility for doing these basic screens on the algorithm is supposed to be predicting A and we can look to see how it's predicting A for these two groups and compare performance. But that's never gonna find label choice bias. And as we've learned over the past couple of years, label choice bias is you know, the biggest problem that's affecting all of these health algorithms. Not to say that there aren't other kinds of biases, but I think that is by far the most common thing we've found. Um, and, and I think it's also the hardest to catch for exactly this reason. Right, we've got... Um... We've got plenty of time, so I'm afraid we're going to keep grilling you for a while. There's plenty of uh, people are still quite enthusiastic. Um, so there's another question here that arose in the chat, actually, which is very interesting. So um, should unifying machine learning frameworks such as tidy models have built in support for fairness metrics? Yeah, I, I mean, I, ab absolutely. I, I think like the, the more ways in which we um, bring this issue to the top of mind, the, the better. Um, and the only caution I'd say is, is maybe the same one as as, um, as I just mentioned, which is that um, we shouldn't be falsely reassured when algorithms pass those generic metrics with flying colors. Because again, you know, if you just take the algorithm's value system as given and evaluate it on that, you might find that it's unbiased, but you might find that it's just doing the wrong thing. And those kinds of um, you know, uh, generic checks that are built into packages are not going to find that. Um, and so, you know, I, not to say that they couldn't, but I think that, that the way many of them are currently built are not going to find these problems. So, you know, for example, I, I think it would be fantastic if in a lot of these packages, you had a, um, an option to not just say how, you know, how is the, the algorithm is supposed to be predicting A, how does it do for A um, in terms of accuracy and in terms of disparities between protected groups. Um, let's also build in a field for like, what is the true underlying quantity of interest? Is that in the data? Um, what are some um, uh, variables in this data frame that could give me some insight into that underlying measure? And now let's look at how the algorithm is doing on those. Um, I think that would actually be very useful, but I think that's not the way um, many of these packages currently are. They just take what the algorithm is doing as given, and I think that can be very dangerous. I've got another two questions here that are slightly similar, so I'm going to kind of try and push them together a bit. So the first one is, um, what do you make of a recent paper showing you can predict race from images across a variety of data sets? And then a related question is, um, we hear stories about medical imaging studies going wrong because of data leakage, leakage from someone with the part of the actual image not related to the part. Was there anything you've done to specifically look at this kind of uh, problem? Yeah. So as I mentioned, you know, I think these are these are two big um, potential confounds with with anything. So I think that you know the the paper you mentioned, I, I think right now it's a it's a preprint, but it seems very convincing, and I think that fits with a lot of other um, indications we have. That, for example, you can read um, age and sex off of uh, retinal images, and so it doesn't seem at all implausible that algorithms would be able to uh, very accurately reconstruct someone's race from looking at their x-rays rays in a way that um, humans might not be able to. Um, and so um, 
So we were very worried about something like that in, in the paper that I mentioned on knee pain. And I think that uh, if you just kind of read through that, um, the, the paper, it just gives a way to, um, to test for that. So basically you kind of see if the algorithm is still able to predict the thing you're interested in, even when you control for not the algorithms, you know, some reconstruction of race that might be doing the work of predicting the outcome, but actual race that is reported by the patient and, and is presumably kind of a, um, you know, th that's the variable we're interested in the disparity in, um, not the algorithm's kind of noisy reconstruction. So if you control for that and the algorithm is still doing the same thing, um, the correlation structure is the same, then you can feel pretty good that that variable isn't how the algorithm is getting there. Um, and so I think that that's, um, you know, w worth keeping in mind in, in a lot of these studies, but there are ways to deal with that. And in the same way, there are, you know, these well-known artifacts like, you know, um, where the uh, where the little um, R is placed, or you know, X-ray machines differ that can easily allow an algorithm to know whether a patient is coming from site A or site B. Um, and so, I think th those are also very top of mind for, or they should be top of mind for anyone doing work in this field. I think in the same way that you can kind of control for um, race and, and make sure that's not how the algorithm is getting its answer, you can also just make sure that the algorithm is predicting well across sites. So you hold out a site, you make sure the algorithm can predict um, that site from all of the other sites. Um, and so there, there are just ways to kind of like start crossing these problems off of um, off of your list. Great. Okay. So I think, uh, I think we're going to wrap up soon. Um, I think people are still wanting to ask you questions though. So I'm being asked whether you're going to be in the birds of the feather session that's coming up later and, and whereabouts you'll be. Uh, tragically, I was not able to, uh, I'm, uh, teaching this semester and, um, uh, you know, of course teaching is wonderful, but it also makes life chaos. So, uh, unfortunately my schedule is, is not the way I want it to be this semester. So I wasn't able to make it, but, um, please, you know, e email me, um, tweet at me. I can also, I'll, I'll stay on in the, um, in the chat for a little bit and, uh, and just scroll through and make sure I didn't miss anything, but thank you guys so much. This was, um, fantastic. Thanks for the great questions and, and all the interest and, um, look forward to being in touch. Great. Thank you. So I think what's happening now is, oh.
Hello, sorry, we're back. Uh, yes, so the there's some there's a break now. This the next talk is 24 minutes past, and uh, we if you go to the spatial chat now, and there's a bit of feedback going on in the chat here as well. And yes, so either go, basically go to the spatial chat, uh, answer the feedback questions in this chat, or we'll see you in the next talk at 24 minutes past. Thank you.